Oh, since Vanessa and I have visited here before, we're going to take this personally. Welcome back to the home of Luto. Events in the lives of Jeff and Vanessa have once again led us to Flagstaff, Arizona and the Lowell Observatory. Instead of having to climb Mars Hill, afoot we took the trailer up. Now here we go, a little pop quiz. First question is, what do these symbols represent? And if you said the planets of our solar system, you got it right. This particular planet is a bone of contention among some astronomers. Do you remember what it was? Pluto. And within the orbit of Pluto, something that looks like a fork, well, that would be the symbol of the god Poseidon otherwise known as Neptune. Inside the orbit of Neptune is this thing that looks like an arrowhead and a solar disk. That's Uranus, of course. Within the orbit of Uranus is this thing that looks like a scythe, often associated with death. But in this case, it's the planet that has a ring, Saturn. Within the orbit of Saturn is the giant planet of our solar system. It looks like the symbol number four. And that, of course, is Jupiter. Now, if anybody remembers this symbol, there was a book that came out about 20 or 30 years. It was called Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And between Mars and Venus, too cold, too hot is the sweet spot, the planet Earth. And finally, orbiting very close to the sun, taking no more than a couple of months to make a complete sweep of its orbit. This eared antenna, eared type of symbol here is that of the planet Mercury. You will not see a symbol for the planet Vulcan anywhere here because there is a question as to whether it really exists. One thing I paid a little more attention to as we drove up Mars Hill Road to get to the Halal Observatory Complex was the altitude. It's about, I think the last reading I looked at was about 7,200 feet. As an amateur astronomer, when I go, go touring, with my fellow observer, El Marco, the minimum altitude we like to be at for good observing is about 6,000 feet. Of course, well away in the light dome, in light pollution. Finally caught up with Vanessa here. And if we look at this sign here entering into the observatory grounds, we're still in the COVID restriction era. Reservations are still required to observe here through, through the Lowell, through the 25 inch refractory telescope. Now my inclination was to head straight up and have a walk around of the actual observatory building. While that's possible at other observatory spots, here they're saying authorized personnel only. And that of course prompts me to think Maybe we can get authorized. Once again, we find ourselves at the Steel Visitor Center. This time, fortunately, the camera I'm using is not about to run out of battery charge. So, let's see if we can learn a bit more. You will remember, may remember this pseudo globe, it's supposed to represent Mars, which was Percival Lowell's main obsession as an astronomer. Of course, you may have also noticed or recalled from last time that this is the home of the observatory that discovered the outermost planet of our solar system, 
While of course since that time many bodies have been found out further in the solar system, uh, not as far out as the Oort cloud, but in the Kuiper belt. And astronomers are looking for these planets. None have yet been declared as planetary bodies. Here we are, the main entrance. And we discover it is locked. So we have to go around and see if we can find another entrance where we can talk to the folks about videoing. Oh, Vanessa just told me someone's inside. Maybe they'll come to the door. So Vanessa and I chanced to stop by the Lowell Observatory because the last time we were here, we talked to the director, whose name happens to be Jeff, about future plans for the observatory as COVID lockdown has concluded. And apparently now at least you can get in the, you can get into the visitor center. You can go on a tour. The tour will tell you take you up to the various domes apparently. You may be able to poke your head in. And um, they are now having by but it's all of that is by reservation. And apparently they may or they have already or may be resuming stargazing nights as uh, Miranda mentioned using the smaller scopes that are staged underneath uh, a roofing so to keep them out of the weather. So they may be returning to that. Here's a continuation of the grounds and the actual gate that enters into the Lowell Observatory observing grounds. You can see some of the probably a science center there. You can see a rather largest dome off in the distance. hidden by trees here, parking area for employees. It's probably a, a maintenance facility off in the direction of the west. And now, uh, visitor parking area. And the interesting question is, exploration. Little object to art. There are, of course, other domes. That one was to the west. And I'll take a look at the ones that are to the east of the visitor center as we proceed. Here we have a smaller observatory for probably a smaller scope. Nothing bigger than 12 to 16 inches, likely. And it may be used potentially for small group observation. Could also potentially be used for exoplanet detection. And if I shift over here to the right, you can see a larger observatory. And that observatory would house something certainly in the 40 inch range if such a scope is there. I'm not sure what the original Lowell Observatory was, but that one may very well be it. Although I would have thought they would want it right in the front. The door was open, we just had to pull it. We just couldn't push it. Hey, we stopped by about a month ago and we did a video and I talked to Jeff. And we just happened to be back in the area because we have, we have to return to Tucson unexpectedly. Is Jeff available? Uh, I don't know. And your name, if you want to be included in our video? Robert. Robert, thank you, Robert, for looking in on that. Uh, Jeff and Vanessa of Golden Phoenix Publishing, YouTube channel. So here we are in the lobby of the main visitor center here at the Lowell Observatory. And Roberts, as we met earlier, is still looking into whether or not we can meet with the director. Again, because we had met him last time, we just didn't have any battery power left to interview him. He gave us a nice talk. So here are some of the facilities associated with 
a remote location, I think. I don't think this is actually here in, in the Flagstaff area. There is a remote location where they have some uh, more advanced equipment for astronomy. Here's a nice board here. It's about research. Probing the regolith of the classic, classical Uranian satellites on their surfaces mantled by a layer of tiny H2O ice grains. New discovery frontiers with sensitive milli arc second rule as a resolution. So there must be some, uh, some way of making, getting rid of the atmospherics in terms of reducing the resolution of the telescope. Disk resolve photometric properties of Pluto, material on its surface. Discovery of a nearby 17 kilometer per second star ejected from the Milky Way by Sagittarius A. Right, so that would be an object whose gravity has been tossed out by this object. And Sagittarius A I'm not familiar with. Mean magnetic field strength of, of Chi Chi, it should be Chi, I think, Tau, or CL Tau. Orbital parameters for a young low mass spectroscopy binary star in Orion. So that has to do with how long it takes the orbit of the binary system to go around each other. Integrating cultural astronomy with public outreach. Uh, 2019 outburst of the Buddhids. Massive star content of the Luck Hodge, NGC 1910. And a large Magellanic cloud. Massive star content. Must be very young stars to be that massive. X-ray ultraviolet observations. Unveiling variable elements of a hot Jupiter that they discovered in the exoplanet program. Molecular cloud structure at low metallicity. Well, that simply means mostly made out of hydrogen and helium. Precision in space manufacturing for structurally connected interferometry. Interferometry is a way of using two telescopes to increase, increase resolution, which may refer back to the previous micro arc, arc second resolution. Young binaries as laboratories for disk evolution. So those are young stars that are paired up. Luminosity function of red supergiants in M31. M31 is the Andromeda galaxy, and they're looking into how luminosity probably and distance correlate. There's a dwarf activity and flaring in the ultraviolet domain of the star planet activity research CubeSat, Sparks. So that would be a class M dwarf star looking at the ultraviolet spectrum, which is uh, ultraviolet it cannot be seen by the human eye because the frequency is too high. So once again, they're probably using this observing center here for some of those projects. Moving around. Here we have a telescope. I'm wondering which observatory it's at. Obviously one of the modern ones. Um, and it's on a massive, massive amount. Now here's an interesting thing. If you, if you roll a coin around this basin, you will give you the experience of a star or a planet falling into a more massive object. Because this is the classic way of explaining gravitational fields, field curvature, according to Einstein. That basically it's like a fourth dimension in which everything gets sucked to the center. They call it a gravity well. So this is a demonstration of how a gravity well might uh, affect a, ro a re revolving body around a central massive object. Here we have, very nice, a loving portrayal of the surface of Pluto. And that surface is pocked with craters, has uh, both high and low level um, reflectance areas on it. So there's probably ices of different components and rocks on Pluto changing the reflectivity to sunlight. But it's so far out there, it's amazing. And it looks like folks are arriving for a presentation and I am going to evacuate, leave this room so they can go forward with their presentation. Neighboring that area there is the Gilchrist Lecture Hall. So, and here we have a room. Ooh, there's a nice view. 
and I'm not sure who's at the eyepiece, whether it's Lowell or not. The, the, the suit looks a little more modern. There's a small telescope, small Newtonian, probably for some field work, and they, I doubt this would have been the telescope that was used to check seeing conditions for the observatory, but it may very well be, so I'm going to speculate about that because they have, when they set up observatories, they want to go find the finest seeing conditions. Seeing conditions are the stability of the atmosphere and its transparency. So they can get the maximum amount of information in terms of photons or light coming from distant objects with the least amount of distortion and greatest intensity. So just a quick sweep through here reminds me of uh, Smith, the Carnegie Center where we, a couple of years back, Vanessa and I went to hear a lecture on uh, op plant, potential objects and planets in the Kuiper Belt. And here I go, exiting. Okay, our last stop is the Starry Skies shop. And we talked to this lovely lady earlier. Hi, and your name is? Miranda. Miranda. You know, that sounds like it should be the name of a planet or a star. <laughs> well, thank you. That's quite the compliment. So, Miranda, how do you like working here? I love working here. It's really great. Yeah, it's a really great team of people. Obviously beautiful, as Flagstaff is. Flagstaff and is. We get to learn a lot and feel very... Yeah. Do you have... leave here feeling very humbled. I'll ah, say what humbles you? The night sky? The yeah, immensity of it all? Yeah, I would say everyone it humbles them. Um, it's the night sky, yeah. Um, have you yourself looked through any of the telescopes? I have. Oh, I have wonderful. Is there anything you, were, oh, you have a tra background in astronomy? No, 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 no. Okay. that was a training. Just right? part of your training? I did, yeah, yeah. Do you recall anything you looked at that you, you made you lose breath? <gasps> like um, that? I mean, yeah, a few different things. I, I don't remember the names of them exactly, but Were they, they planets or were they stars One thing I remember galaxies? a lot was, it was like a nebulae, um, and it was basically like green. Stardust, just like a smudge. Oh, what, so was it faint or was it really bright? It was pretty bright. I mean, you well, can see like individual stars in it. Um, okay, that may very well have been the Great Nebula in Orion. And yeah, it's got, it was. It's mm -hmm. got like these stars at the core of it. Mm -hmm. And there's a neighboring nebula that's an NGC that's nearby. And in a small telescope, it looks like a giant eagle's wing because there's a dark part of it that looks like the eagle's wing. And then there's a bright part of it. Yeah, that yeah. is the nebula. So that is absolutely spectacular. Right. I just remember how green it was compared to everything else. It was, it was very. Do you know which tel and, uh, Do you know which telescope you were looking through? I know you got to get to. It was one of the the GeoVail ones. That, how big are those? Uh, I'm not sure. They're, it's just six smaller telescopes that mm -hmm. are up on a deck up there. Oh, okay. Um, they're so, not covered. There's a ceiling that comes out. Oh, the roof they're car they're covered. kind of like star party telescopes mm -hmm. where small yeah, groups will come <laughs> and somebody will lead. Them. Yeah, yeah. A lot of our tours bring you up to the to the Godo, as we call it. It's GeoVail Open Deck Observatory um, is the name. So. Uh, yeah, in the shop here, is there something <laughs> that people see and they go, oh, I never thought there'd be something like that? I mean, that honestly, I the thing is more like the Catern t-shirt is what people yeah, love. Yeah, people love wearing, wearing shirts about where they've been, especially if they're kind of exotic lo yeah, locations. Yeah, it says wool in the corner, so and it glows uh, in the dark. I mean, that's one, you know, I've only been here for a month. <laughs> so, just a and month. We, and we haven't actually gotten any Well, that's true. With like COVID, a, you wouldn't have had many people come in, would you? During mm -hmm. the well, it was totally closed up until yes, late of course, March of course. for a year, and uh -huh. we haven't gotten any new orders in yet, but I know once we do we'll have like a lot more stuff I mean a lot of people they like the space suits obviously and um, the space monkey things well wow, so yeah I'll... I mean you know we but we have some pretty cool stuff I mean like all that jewelry is Moldavite which is a Moldavite. meteor um, wow. and that's pretty precious um, it's like a green crystal oh sure thing. oh yeah um, so yeah Hi. well I'll just I mean, do a quick walk meteor. around yeah yeah I think I'm showing you I mean this is, um, right here. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I mean, all of these, these bracelets here are Moldavite, which Moldavite. is... Moldavite. It's a semi-transparent uh, crystal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It looks like Yeah, that. it's 
meteors mine forever. I mean, I knew because my sister actually had a piece of all the way from Russia. Mm. A meteor there that she bought online that was about $200. Yeah, they're very, <laughs> that's, they're, these are priced pretty well, I would say, even just for what it is. I mean, I would have to speculate that the Moldavite is probably something that's formed as it crashes into the Earth's atmosphere because it needs enough heat to form that crystal structure. So that's yeah. interesting. So it's almost like a marriage of the Earth and whatever the meteor was that hit the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, it must be. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm sure you know much more about the astronomy. Well, yeah, some than things. But, uh, so yeah. here's the rest of the shop. I'm going to just swing around briefly so people can get a look. Then I'm going to go show you a Newtonian telescope. And this is a Newtonian telescope. It looks like about an eight inch aperture scope. And they do sell it here. It's an Orion SkyQuest. Yeah, I've, I've observed the Orion telescopes before for a little less than four, $400. And just in terms of how it works, it has a central mount that just pivots around. So it's a, a, it's a type of mount that basically you circle with the telescope. But if you elevate the telescope, you basically tilt it this way and that way. It has what is called a unit finder on it. This is the part that you use to help line up on whatever you want to observe. And then of course, it has a focusing unit right here. And so actually, unlike some telescopes you may be aware of, there's no lens in the front. There's actually a mirror in the back, which reflects, concentrates and reflects the light up to another mirror, which you can't see inside here which bounces it, smaller mirror, bounces it in the eyepiece. So you can see, you can examine it. I'm gonna leave you with one more thing. When I was your age, Pluto was a planet. Now, really give this some thought. There's no true authority about what planets are and planets aren't. If you claim authority about it, you basically have to convince everybody else that a thing is either a planet or not a planet. Whatever it has to be, you have to get consensus. Well, personally, I would not give my vote to removing Pluto from the list of our solar system's wonderful planets. Signing off, Jeff, bye-bye. This here is actually a piece of the comet, a meteor, not sure which yet, that struck uh, Ari northern Arizona near Winslow. So it's, uh, we, Vanessa and I are about to head over to the, to the meteor crater. Now, uh, there's a difference between calderas, which are volcanic of the earth spewing forth matter, and meteor impacts. When an, uh, a meteor impacts the earth, the material that leaves behind is a meteorite. And apparently the meteor create, crater that we're going to see is probably in the kilometers across. So the, it, the actual meteor itself must have been a kilometer, at least a kilometer in size, half a mile or so. But here we go. This looks like iron to me. It's an iron. It may have some stone embedded in it, but it's mostly an iron meteorite. So here we go. This is a nice segue to our next place to drop by called the Verkamp Meteorite found near Meteor Crater and apparently somehow it got transferred here to the Lowell Observatory and let me just give you a quick overview of what it says here about the Meteor Crater. 50,000 years ago a chunk of nickel iron about the size of a commercial airliner so it was only two or three hundred feet in diameter screamed through the atmosphere at 30 miles per second slammed into limestone rock 35 mil miles east of present-day Flagstaff, creating a hole three-quarter mile across and 570 feet deep. The hole has been known as Coon Mountain, Barrington Crater, Canyon Diablo Crater, and today, Meteor Crater, Arizona. It is the best preserved impact crater known on Earth, and it is widely recognized natural landmark. We'll be back in 15 minutes. That was a Billy Strayhorn tune, Take the A Train. I'm sure no one ever heard that.